I'm going to start, I think, sharing my screen just to make sure that. OK. Uh, in Rust. OK, nice. All right. So, uh, well, it's 901. Let's let's get started uh, with kind of the the boring stuff, I guess. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, OK. Sure. Can you guys see it? Show of hands, yeah, thumbs up, nice. All right, let's do it. Um, so hands on Russ, my name's Philip. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a software developer, been doing this for quite a while now. It's kind of, it's crazy to, to count years at some point, but I guess it's almost like 10 years I'm like writing code, uh, mostly front end, um, back end, uh, web apps and stuff like that, mobile as well, TypeScript, JavaScript. And I got into Rust um, earlier this year. Um, so I'm not the like, Rust super ninja or anything like that. Uh, but I've been, I'm, I've been learning it actively. I'm quite interested in it. Uh, and I've done some development for embedded systems. So um, I programmed a firmware, a piece of firmware for a ESP32 chip. Um, which basically that was my first kind of embedded project. So I had to learn Rust and embed it. So I was like literally Googling what UART or I squared C is. Um, that's how bad uh, my understanding of this was. So it was like a mix of things. And I kind of really got into Rust um, kind of through that avenue. And um, so here I am, uh, you know, men mansplaining Rust to you. So what's Rust? I was looking at uh, cool memes to put here and uh, Rosha C. Bruno, uh, he has a whole repository on GitHub. I'm gonna share these slides with you so you guys can go and uh, help yourself to it. Um, it's got a lot of funny memes about Rust, I think. So um, here's, here's one of those. Um, so hopefully uh, I, there, there are some mind bending stuff about Rust that I kind of relate to as far as this image is concerned, but hopefully uh, you know, we can demystify maybe some some of them and kind of get you started on the on the journey. If you go to Wikipedia, um, here's how they talk about Rust. It's a multi-paradigm general purposes programming programming language, um, which I guess in, in plain words, what it means is that uh, it's general purpose, as in like you know, you can do a bunch of stuff with it. So you can write you can write firmware, you can write um, just general software that runs on the computer. You can write um, WebAssembly related stuff. So something's going to run in your browser with some pretty crazy uh, like native performance, pretty much. Um, and you can you can use it like on servers. And um, so it's it's got it's got pretty much everything you might want from a language. Um, I guess multi-paradigm means that you know you can write functional code in it, you can write object-oriented code in it, kind of. We're gonna see maybe some of it hopefully today. So you have a lot of options. That's that's kind of how I interpret this. Um, the emphasis is on performance, type safety, and concurrency. So basically, it's Rust gives you access to this world that kind of used to be reserved to you know these crazy C C plus plus guys, and that's just not made for humans. You know those languages, in my opinion. I've done some of it, and it's kind of like you kind you really you really lose. Um, some human aspects kind of working on that stuff. So Rust, thanks to its compiler, it, uh, it, it kind of brings you back to, to um, something that's a bit, a bit more approachable to, to mere mortals. Um, and so it's strongly typed and statically typed. So basically, as long as the compiler is happy, uh, there is a really high chance that your software is just going to run and um, it's not going to have bugs in it. Which is uh, which is really nice if you come from like a JavaScript world or or even TypeScript. Um, why Rust? So real quick, performance. We talked about it. Great developer experience, um, ecosystem, and tools. Um, I'm going to show you something. So this is kind of this is anecdotal, but um, this is from a GitHub repository uh, that's. Basically, like a collection of uh, ESP32 related um, software, and I commented 
And I was like, oh, I was able to use this feature, ta -da -ta, and here's the response from the, from the guy maintaining the repository, that he basically, he never even ran that piece of code on the actual hardware. He, he just made sure that you know, it compiled inside the Visual Studio code. And he shipped it, and you know, boom, all of a sudden, it actually works. Um, so I mean, anecdotal, but it, that's kind of what I mean when I, when I talk about um, developer experience uh, applied to, to this thing. All right, so enough with uh, talking. Um, we're going we're gonna to write some code, basically. So I outlined this in kind of three little rounds here. Um, the hello world of Rust, again, um, just going to jump in my editor, and uh, I'm going to go through that, look at the variables, functions, if statements, just you know the basic stuff that everything's kind of made of, out of. Round two, we're going to look at vectors, um, so basically array structures, moves, borders, and wraps. I put this face here because I think that's the like that's where it's kind of one of the most mind-bending stuff for us as far as far as like I'm concerned. I think based on my experience and a lot of feedback that I've seen from people, um, we're going to look at uh, structures, and finally we're going to look at enums. How do you handle errors? Generics and traits. So th this is a bit, a bit more of kind of like uh, higher order stuff that brings you back to, um, that brings you to the world of maybe like object oriented programming, uh, more along these lines. Um, okay, let's go. So let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Are you guys with me? Show of hands. Yeah. Okay, nice. Let's see. We got ten people. All right. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of this. Okay, so we are in the Visual Studio Code here on the left, uh, right hand side is my terminal running Rustlings. And basically, I mean, Rustlings is a collection of exercises of, that kind of demonstrate um, how to like how to write uh, Rust code. So we're gonna go to uh, we're gonna go to the first exercise. So in our case, it's called. Uh, Intro to Hello World. Um, so here's a here's a Rust program, pretty much. So your first um, your first uh, Rust program, and I mean the goal here it's I guess it's kind of a game. We we trying to make this thing run correctly, right? So a big uh, I think a big part of uh, what makes Rust so amazing is the compiler, and you're gonna spend you're gonna spend a lot of time with the compiler basically trying to please it trying to make things run but the way it like the way it kind of talks to you the way it's structured is you actually it's like a good friend you know it's not like just something annoying so um so here for example you know the, the um what i'm trying to say is like the error messages here for example are generally like really well phrased and you kind of get half of the thing solved just by looking at the error message um so if you if you're familiar with JavaScript uh, or TypeScript, you know you kind of know string interpolation, and you probably used to kind of this sort of um, syntax where it's like, oh, it's my bar, and you know it gets kind of hello and da da da. So Rust has a really similar thing. You know uh, the 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 most immediate kind of placeholder thing is these two is these two brackets. And then whatever comes next, it just gets um, interpol interpolated, right? So if we just do this, hello world, this thing's gonna compile, and my machine is really slow, I don't know why. Um, but uh, hopefully we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see a, wow, okay. All right, so <laughs> we're done. We made this happen, basically, hello world. Congratulations, everybody, 11 people. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's probably the smallest program you can write. You could probably simplify it by just... by just doing this. And that probably would work as well. But we actually learned about string interpolation in the process. Um, something to um, something to notice is this kind of weird syntax with a little um, exclamation mark. 
Um, that's a macro. We're not going to touch macros, but just um, for all intents and purposes, think of them as functions, but slightly fancier. Okay? So whenever you see that little uh, exclamation mark, that's a macro. And it's a slightly more advanced technique. We're not going to touch on it today, but you know the word and you can look it up. All right. So um, we're done with the intro. Our next exercise is about variables. Again, I mean, nothing groundbreaking here. We inside of the main function. Do -do -do, we're trying to print the value and we have this thing here. And obviously there's something wrong with this. What the compiler is telling us is that is that that X is not found in, in, in the scope, right? Um, and the reason is that we, we haven't really declared a variable. To declare a variable in, um, in Rust, you need to use um, keyword. And so now that I've done it, um, and if my compiler starts compiling, all right. Uh, so again, when you need something as a variable, um, you just put a let in front. Um, you can you can also you can also see how the type is basically deduced. Remember that uh, we said that this is this is a strongly typed language and statically typed. Uh, as you as you've noticed so far, we haven't really put any kind of annotation as far as types are concerned. Uh, the compiler is smart enough to understand what a type is when it comes to um, something primitive like uh, like five in this case. Okay, so we we'll save this and. Um, we should be done and taken to our next exercise, which is variables too. And here again, um, Rust is complaining about not knowing what the type is, right? So it's, it would be nice to then show how we would declare something of a given type. So you do it by using a, using a column. And in this particular case, we're gonna say, I32, so there are a bunch of different types that um, Rust has for, for numbers. They are a bit less, um, you know, it's, there are a lot of like U8. It, it, it kind of brings you back to a slightly kind of more, um, I guess, old school, lower level programming languages, as opposed to saying number or integer or something like that. So in this particular case, I32, that refers to a 32-bit integer. and we can also initialize it by giving it a value of 10. So um, again, super kind of super straightforward, but um, getting us sort of the building blocks for um, what's going next and what's coming next. And you, you, you're also getting kind of a sneak peek at, um, at the if statement already. So, you know, it looks pretty, pretty kind of conventional. We're gonna look, take a closer look at it uh, in the next um, exercise. So uh, we're done with that exercise again, and um, we're going to variables four. So um, let's see. Um, what's happening here is we effectively declaring uh, on line seven, we're saying, okay, we have this variable called x and it should be three, then we print it. And then we're saying, oh, actually that equal five, right? And that's, it seems like that's where the problem is again. Um, direct your attention to the output of the compiler and, and see how like it's really trying to, it's really trying to help you, right? It's, it's kind of giving, it's giving away the answers to this exercise all by itself. So I think that's like a big part of infatuation that a lot of developers have with the language is that all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's not some like obscure error message with a crazy stack trace, right? It's like, look, First assignment to X, consider making this binding mutable. Well, how do I do that? Well, it's telling you there, right? It says, it says uh, mute X, so we just do that. So let's try to do this. So we're gonna say let X be mutable, all right? And um, dun -dun, it's compiling. So when I was telling about speed and performance, I was not referring to the speed and performance of my machine. I don't know why it's acting this way, but usually these things are these things are pretty fast. Anyhow, we're done with uh, we're done with this exercise as well. So we, we learned about mutable variables, very important. Um, and we're switching to functions now. Let's see. All right. So. Um, 
Okay, and so the main the main stuff we've seen it in plenty of exercises so far. Um, here we actually declaring um, two other functions. So kind of typical outline of a, of maybe a C C plus plus program or like a little Python script that you're writing. So you you often find this in in the Rust world as well, right? So we declare a, fun a function um, sale price is even that looks like it doesn't really have any problems. Um, here, for example, uh, the compiler is complaining because we haven't really provided a, um, a return type for the sale price. If you look at the sale price, inside of it is the body, um, which is basically an if statement that looks at um, the price that we provided, looks at, looks at it and just figure out if it's even or not, and then does a little logic. A couple of things um, to notice here. See how... Um, See how we basically have these returns without kind of doing any returns in um, returns as in like doing return, oops, return as in doing uh, return. So this is this is a um, this is a valid um, syntax in Rust. You can do this. So this looks way more like you know your TypeScript, JavaScript, um, C, C++, and whatnot. But Rust also has this um, this little thing where it basically, whenever a block does not have um, a, a semicolon following it, it basically can evaluate evaluates and it returns it essentially. So the return um, the return value of sale price um, function is the return value of this block, which you know if we look at specific kind of branches of it is either price minus 10 or price minus three. Okay, so this gets returned. And I mean, looking at this, we know that it's basically gonna return this I32 um, integer. So what was missing here is annotation, but you kind of also see how clean, how clean these kind of formatting and um, just this overall um, convention is. So you just, to, you know, whenever there's no semicolon that marks a statement, an expression gets evaluated and it gets returned. So that's what we just did. Um, so that's the uh, that's the first function exercise, and we're going to ifs now. So we kind of we've seen them already, sort of. Um, but there's something there's something more interesting in this particular example because. Apart from learning about ifs, we're also going to learn about um, unit tests. So unit tests in um, in Rust they coexist, they, they co-inhabit um, the module. Uh, so this particular module here, which is um, which is a little um, only has one function, but nonetheless, um, so there's a bit of kind of funky funky annotation to it. So you know you. You declare a module called tests. You're using you're using these specifiers to basically tell us that this is a this is a test, a suite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you kind of there's a bit of there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of boilerplate here. But the bottom line is, um, wh whatever function you have in here that is annotated with the the test extension. Um, we're gonna run. We're gonna run actual tests um, on it. So as you can see here, um, we just assert that left and right are equal, and we assert that um, given a bigger, given two uh, these two variables into the bigger, which is ten and eight, the bigger the bigger of them is returned, um, and this is just a unit test, right? So our goal now is to implement bigger. So First of all, this thing compiles. I mean, and second of all, our unit tests run. Okay, so try to do that, and maybe we can um, maybe we can make a deliberate mistake just to see how tests work. So I'm just going to say that if a if a is bigger than b, so I'm just writing writing a simple simple if statement. I'm going to return be here. So again, I'm being deliberately kind of wrong about it. 
Otherwise, I'm going to return A. And let's see, let's see where this gets us. So this should resolve the issue that um, we just saw, which was about, about the return types. The compiler is happy. However, our unit tests are not happy. And so the, the output here is basically telling us, look, we're expecting, we're expecting 10 here in this particular case. So left is set to 10, right is eight. So eight came out of this. Here left is 42 and right is 32, right? So obviously the issue is the issue is in this logic here, and we can easily we can easily fix it by um, just kind of switching the sense around. And this this compiles again, so it's it's valid, and we pass the unit tests. Okay, and this is I mean like this is really cool way of kind of working on your code. Um, and I mean, a lot of languages support that stuff, but also like Rust is, you know, it's really um, all that, all these instruments are baked in. You don't need to add anything. It's just, it's just there and it works great. All right. So looks like we are moving to vectors. And um, so slightly, slightly pick up pace maybe here as far as kind of complex code complexity is concerned. So, so far we looked at um, kind of primitive types of scalars, if you wish. Now let's look at the collection of items. So uh, standard, uh, Rust standard library comes with a collection of tools that you kind of, would, you would assume a, a given language has. So, you know, there, there are vectors, which are basically their arrays or lists, their hash maps, their, you know, all that kind of stuff that you, you would expect from a modern language to have. So in this particular case, um, we are basically going to loop through the vector, a, a thing that you, you know, you're probably going to do on like a day-to-day -day, um, life with Rust, uh, basically like all the time. And we're going to look at two ways of doing it. Okay, so here, uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and maybe comment this out so we can focus on just one thing and just make it work because otherwise the um, it's going to be a bit confusing all right so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna focus on the um on the looping part and then we're going to look at the mapping all right so again first objective let's try to make this compile and maybe it's also gonna pass the unit test in in the process whenever you want to loop over a a vector or any other collection per se that supports a um, concept of iterator, you will um, you, you will use iteration. So you're gonna you're gonna convert you're gonna basically extract an iterator of your collection. So here you have this vector, which um, again for those familiar with templates in maybe C++ or as well as TypeScript, that's just a way to of saying this vector has i32s inside, right? So it's really basic, but a way of basically um, supporting a generic collection in this particular case, instantiated with i32s. And um, to loop through it, basically, we well, could use uh, either um, iterator or a mutable iterator. So in this particular case, um, our task is to double every single argument inside every single element inside the iterator, right? So because we're gonna be changing the value um, of the element, we need, to, um, we need to ask for a mutable iterator. And that's what we do here. So then um, what comes out on the other side is a pointer to the element. So keep in mind, this is not the actual value of the element, but rather a pointer. So just like that, we're kind of descending <laughs> one uh, one floor down into something that you know. I guess people in like C C plus plus world are way more comfortable with than people um, dealing with higher um, higher level languages. But in this particular case, instead of point, instead of getting the actual uh, the actual value of the variable, we're gonna we're gonna get an address that points to uh, we're gonna we're gonna get an address of this thing in the memory, and 
from there, um, we'll need to basically dereference this reference, and you do it by uh, by using the star. That's basically that basically says, okay, go to this address and you know pull whatever's out there, and then to to multiply it by two, basically, all you need to do is um, kind of do do this thing here. So it's um, it's one of these operators that allows you to kind of run the thing in place. And uh, let's see if this thing compiles. Okay, it does. So uh, well, it not only compiles, but it, it also looks like we passed the we passed the the unit test. Um, so main takeaway here, uh, using iterator, and whenever using iterator, remember, it's because it's a bit, uh, I find it a bit annoying, at least initially as, as I was learning Rust, you always get an address, you always get a reference, you never get, you don't get the value, so you, you have to remember to dereference it if you, if you need to dereference it. In this particular case, we do, because we wanna be, we wanna be getting the value behind it and, and uh, multiplying it by two. Um, so that's looping through um, a vector using iterator. Now we can map through it as well using the iterator. Um, so like the, the, the map reduce filter, like all these kind of uh, functional, uh, functional stuff that you know, a lot of people are used to um, if they, you know, if they do a lot of functional programming, if you, if you ever got into libraries like underscore or um, low dash, you're also familiar with that because, you know, th those basically kind of popularize a lot of these concepts in the world of you know, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, so exact same, exact same situation here. Um, again, we have our vector of I32s. We grab an iterator. Notice that we're not asking for a mutable iterator, but just a just a regular one. And then we map through it. Um, inside that map, we we basically have what um, what's basically called like an inline function. Um, it's like a lambda function, right? That's just gonna that's gonna you you kind of represent it in this very compact way, and um, it just allows you to do stuff with with the given num here. So um, again, our our goal is to just double the stuff. So we just return a num times two, and uh, we'll let this thing compile it and run it. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oops. I didn't save it. Okay. Uh, it's testing, 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 and we're good. So we looped through it and mapped values. Again, a, um, I guess uh, it's one of those things that you're going to be doing on a kind of on a daily basis. So you kind of bread and butter um, of Rust. So these are, uh, these are vectors, again, I think there's a bit like the, the this bit is a bit too much uh, too many moving parts in this particular exercises, and but the good news that was easy. I think we were like we're moving to we're moving to the part that's to me at least, and I think a lot of people in the community um, share this frustration is the is the the so-called move semantics, um, and let's try. There, I think we're going to do three or uh, four, maybe four exercises on move semantics alone, because it's almost like the most mind-bending uh, thing about Rust. So let's um, let's see how we can, how far we can get. Um, okay, this one's easy, right? Again, we have to we have to look at the we have to kind of talk to the compiler about this, right? So. Line 13, we're trying to push something. We're, gonna, we're trying to push a value of 88 into our vector. And it's saying that it cannot borrow as mutable. Um, 
Okay, so whenever you pass a variable into uh, another function or like another block, um, by using a reference, um, it's called borrowing. So Rust has a particular system in place um, where it, that it uses to decide when something should be, when memory should be freed up or not. So there's no, um, there's no garbage collector. Um, so, you know, it gives, it gives you high performance because of that, because it doesn't garbage collect um, in, the middle of your, in the middle of your program. But it asks you to basically keep good, um, pay good attention to how variables are moved around. Where do you put them and how do you let um, other pieces of code use them? So why is, uh, why is this uh, push function trying to borrow something? Well, the vector is a, um, it's a complex structure, right? So it's a, it's an actual, it's not a, it's not a, like a, it's not a scalar or uh, some really basic type. It's a, it's a complex element that actually has methods. And it turns out that a method would actually, you know, you would look at this instance of the, of the vector and it's, and it tries to borrow it. So it basically tries to kind of grab it and hold on to it. And because this push here um, will modify the existing underlying vector, um, it, it assumes that it's mutable, but it's not, right? And why is it not mutable? Well, the answer is really simple. We just didn't, uh, we didn't declare it as mutable. So you actually fix it by just putting mutable here, which is really easy. But uh, I wanted, I mean, I took this like, you know, would feel like half an hour trying to explain it, uh, just to just to uh, just to kind of uh, get you guys comfortable with thinking about these um, the idea of like borrowing and ownership and all that stuff because we're gonna we're gonna see more of it. So let's take another look at a different example. I think the best way to get comfortable with this is to look at as many different aspects of it and then pause and then do more of that next day because I find these, uh, it's, I think it's the most uh, particular aspect of Rust that you will see um, throughout the whole language. Okay, um, so here's another one. Um, we have a function here that's supposed to fill a vector and um, return it, okay? And it does get in a sort of like initial vector inside of it as, as this uh, vec parameter. And then, so here we just declare a new vector. Again, you know, this is kind of particular syntax, which you're gonna see a lot in, uh, in, different, in different parts of Rust, but basically means, okay, create a new vector, then fill a new vector using whatever's in the old one, which in this particular case, there's nothing in there then try to print it, then try to add stuff to it, et cetera, et cetera. So again, let's look at the compiler and see what's going on there. Um, it says on line 21 that it cannot borrow um, VEC as, as mutable. It then complains about it again and again. And uh, well, I guess what can we, what can we um, can we try? To, what can we do about it, right? So, when whenever you whenever you don't want to take ownership of something in Rust, um, you should pass it. You should pass a reference to it to the function or different module that's supposed to be dealing with it. Um, again, a reference is. Is basically a way of saying, okay, this structure is somewhere on this address. Um, kind of go look for it. And the way you do it is you um, you declare it as a um, the pointer. Let's see. Uh, 
So here, for example, instead of passing, instead of passing the actual um, vector element, we can try to put, we can try to um, put a mutable reference to it, and it's done. So this is the reference. Okay. We'll also need to make sure that this thing is mutable because otherwise, um, gonna get in trouble. And obviously here, it should be clear that we accept something that's um, that's mutable. Let's try to save it. This is not gonna work yet, but let's see. Let's see where we kind of where we're heading in this direction. So again, something. Whenever you need a reference to something, you basically put. Um, this ampersand in front of it. You just basically saying, okay, this is not the, this type, but it's a pointer, right? And um, to make sure that it's mutable, so that you actually can change the underlying data, you always have to put the mute. So not a huge fan of this syntax, but this is something that you kind of, you kind of get used to it and it becomes second nature. Okay, so it seems like you know, we kind of, I mean, some, a lot of errors disappeared, but we have something else going on here. And again, uh, this is like, this is when the compiler is super handy. In, okay, it's, it's, it's basically saying, hey, I'm expecting you to return a vector. You're returning a something that's out, that's something that's different, right? And it's, it's telling you that it just found that we're returning a mutable reference to vector. Um, and this is this is probably what we actually want to do. So just annotate this return as follows, and this should give us um, either more errors of different kinds or potentially solve our problems. Okay, so it looks like it actually worked out. Um, let's let's try to do another one. So this one actually, this looks a bit more organic and um, less artificial because it basically says, look, the f we effectively think that fill vector should not, should not take any arguments, kind of solving a lot of problems that we were facing, trying to figure out how to properly annotate those arguments. But like, let it, let it create a structure and let it return the structure and effectively seize the control over it. So the moment that field vector returns a variable inside the, the main function, it's now the main function that's owning that piece of um, that piece of data. So it's responsible for then cleaning it up whenever the main is done. Okay. So uh, the solution here is very simple and it actually is, is a much more elegant way of designing this. Remember, um, I guess keep this in mind that because of these constraints that Rust puts on you, um, you're gonna find your code changing in a way where it will become way more kind of bulletproof because if before you had to, you could kind of get away with whatever you wanted in some different language, because of how strict um, compiler is, it is going to force you to be way more um, kind of tidy about your um, coding preferences. So again, super simple. Um, we don't need vec zero passed in. In fact, this whole thing can just move completely. So we're going to move it to fill vector. And um, we're just gonna say, look, we create an empty vector here, it's mutable, and we return it, okay? And this should solve it, as far as I'm concerned. So notice how, how clean this, this is, because we, we kind of realized that um, we just don't need, we just don't need uh, to pass anything inside the vector basically because we can we can seize control of the of the data 
in this particular case. Okay, so I think we have last one, I promise, for semantics, or actually a couple, <laughs> a couple more. Uh, but this is like, this is uh, again, like I think this is the worst of Rust, basically. So be kind of be patient here. Um, let's read the, let's see the compiler again. What it's saying here is that we just borrowed um, something as mutable on line 10. So remember, it's basically saying, hey, why, why now point at X and in a kind of in a mutable way, right? And then at line 11, we also let Z point at X in a mutable way. Okay, and Rust does not allow it. So in Rust, you can never have two mutable pointers to the same thing. And if you think about it, uh, you can see why having two mutable pointers to the same thing at the same time is a bad idea, right? Because any kind of race condition or you know some crazy some crazy referencing to referencing uh, or you updating this stuff in different places at the same time, it's just not it's not gonna it doesn't lend itself to to um, secure code. How can we fix this? Well. In this particular case, you can fix it by doing just this. Okay, so why why does this kind of work, and you know having these two at the same time doesn't? Well, the compiler figures out this. Okay, you you kind of you have your y pointing to x in a mutable way, and you do something with it. But then you, you basically kind of, you stop here, you know, F starting from line 13 down to um, the, the kind of lifetime of this, which is this block, because nothing beyond that block kind of exists as far as, um, as far as compiler is concerned. Starting from line 13, there's, there's going to be no more attempts at looking at Y or doing something to it. So when you say, okay, Z can point at X now in a mutable way, compiler's like, okay, that's fine. Maybe you just change your mind about how you want to name variables or you kind of you need it for some other business and it's absolutely fine with it. So it's, it's subtle, but if you, if you think about it, it's actually going to save you a lot of headache uh, moving forward. Okay, we have last semantics move semantics and then um we back to we back to stuff that's less um brain damaging so um in this particular case we have we have two functions um get char and string uppercase and the exercise tells us the, the following the get char should not take ownership of the data and it currently is taking ownership of it. Remember, whenever you put, um, whenever you pass an actual type and not a reference, you're basically saying, hey, function, here's data. Um, you, I mean, we're done kind of washing our hands. Uh, you're responsible for whatever happens to this piece, okay? And they're asking us, okay, make it so it doesn't take ownership of the data. S make it so that it takes basically the reference to it, that's the answer, does something to it, and then we're done, okay? So how do you do that? Well, we saw it already. It's, it has to be a, has to be a, um, a reference. In this particular case, get char, boom. Um, use a reference. In uppercase, okay, should take ownership. So the other way around, right? Um, we don't need a we don't need a um, a reference. Please do whatever you need with this thing and get rid of this. So this is semant this is move borrow ownership semantics. Um, it's uh, oops, sorry. Um, again. Whenever you, whenever in doubt, 
you basically get half of your problems solved by comp the compiler itself, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I think this, like the, the, the semantics and all that move, move in ownership is probably one of the most confusing parts of um, Rust. So that's why, so I kind of allocated a ridiculous amount of exercises uh, in retrospect. Um, okay, easy stuff. Um, structures. So whenever you whenever you start um, whenever whenever you, you're going to start basically writing some kind of more real life code, I guess you, you're going to start structuring your data, right? So in typical object oriented languages, you often deal with classes that have methods, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Rust has structures, which then can have methods attached to them. You declare a structure like so by, by basically saying um, what the name of it is. And then you do something here, which, which basically um, for this, for the purpose of this exercise is we need to define a structure that has green, red, and blue as red, green, and blue as um, values. And it's basically a way to represent a color in RGB. Um, you just declare attributes like so uh, by giving them types. So I'm gonna go with uh, uh, I32 here. Uh, again, I32, it's a bit an overkill, but uh, I think it's fine for the for the purposes of the demonstration, and uh, this should be your this should be your um, structure. So we need to fill it up here. This particular exercise. So whenever you have a structure in place, uh, you can you can use it as follows. So it's a bit I guess it's a bit strange, but um, you kind of, you know, you, you kind of, it's, it's sort of declared in this way and using it in the same way, but again, you, you, you get used to it. So, um, like so, and uh, let's see, uh, let's see, okay. So that's, um, that's, a, that's a structure. Again, uh, looks very much like, I guess, C structures. It's not particularly um, kind of groundbreaking. Um, you, can, you can do structures in a different way, right? So a lot of Python people are familiar with tuples. I guess tuples are like just super Pythonic um, for some reason. I guess they're less common in, in other languages. But you can, do, um, you can do tuples as well. So again, here we have a, uh, we have a tuple structure. And all you need to do is to um, just say what kind of type you want out of it. So we're gonna have we're gonna get three i32s. And notice it's it's a bit it's a bit funky, but to to pull stuff out of tuples, you can use um, dot zero notation, dot one, dot two. So basically, um, zero indexed. Uh, um, indices of your thing. And to instantiate it, oops. so we want a tuple here. Um, you're just going to go with, you're just going to go with this um, syntax. Um, you also have unit like structures. So that's for. That's for those uh, kind of funky um, kind of unity elements or something that just sort of represents uh, some kind of unit-like thing in your, in your specific domain. Uh, and you instantiate it just like this, kind of um, pretty basic. Not, I haven't, I haven't come across a lot of this, to be honest, in my kind of day-to-day, -day, but uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it can be found in, in, in maybe standard library a lot. Um, so these are structures. So basically, um, kind of one step closer to object-oriented programming if you want to do it with um, Rust. 
I think we have time for one more before questions. And um, we're going to do another one on structures, where we kind of get uh, something that looks a bit like kind of real world thing. So we have a structure that's supposed to represent an order in our system. So you have like name, year, to do, to do. Uh, we have a little helper that creates a, an order template by a template. So it's got a standard name, um, year, and you know, some, some attributes preset, just like we saw before. Again, remember, you know, no need to basically return anything as long as you have, you have your expression that evaluates to something without a semicolon that just gets shipped automatically. So it's very nice and clean. Um, so here they're asking us to create an order using the, the template. So it's created here. And then we want to effectively um, modify it. So let your order, it's going to point to order template. And we need to change some stuff. Uh, we know already that whenever we want to change stuff, we want to declare stuff is mutable. So we say, hey, um, your order should be mutable. It should take um, data from here. And it's basically going to be this, all the same data. We just want to change the name. So we're going to say your order dot name. So pretty, pretty standard stuff of of doing of doing this kind of stuff. String from. Not going to go into details as to why um, here, but you're going to see this kind of stuff a lot. And the order count should, should be set to one. So your order that count one. So um, attributes work in, an expect, in the expected way. You kind of you reference them. You get the value out. If you want to change them, you can always do it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. OK, so. Let's see, let's see if we can figure this one out. Move occurs because order template has type order, which does not implement the copy trait. And we're saying the value got moved here. So what's the, and then we're saying here, the value was borrowed here after the move. So what happened? When we're doing this assignment here, as mute, the, the, or, we basically, we're moving, we're moving the value of the order template into this guy here, okay? So how can we, how can we fix this? Well, the way, the way we can fix it is we don't need to reference the the order template, right? Because that's clearly causing troubles here. Notice how, again, it's it's kind of it's preventing us from potentially getting ourselves in the, in a in this funny situation where um, your order points to order template, and then you kind of you sort of referencing order template here in, in a in a way that's like, okay, but why? Who 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 owns this? Who owns this value now? Basically, because we. We're kind of saying, look, now your order is taking, is taking over the order template. So in this particular case, the easiest way to fix this is to, to just have our own copy of, of the order template. And um, if we do that, we effectively solve the problem of potential conflicts with, um, with the value pointing to the value of the other thing. We would then kind of reference in a read-only way, or we try to write something to it. So a take a, a takeaway from some of that frustration with the compiler is that it actually um, you actually gonna gonna thank it at the end of the day after after you um, after you kind of you know hit your hit your head against that wall uh, for half a day or so, but it's kind of worth it. Um, it's worth it at the end of the day. 
Um, all right, so there were a few more, <laughs> a few more exercises I was hoping to do, guys, but uh, we didn't get to do them. So we'll have to stop at the structures and I'll, uh, I'll take your questions for about four or five minutes if you have any. Um, I have a question with uh, mute. Um, you always have to write mute as a variable if you want to change it. And if you don't write it, then the function have, has only reading access to it, or? Uh, that is correct, yes. Okay. So it's, it, and also keep in mind that that applies to the references, right? So Rust is very deliberate about um, also saying, look, okay, you, you asked me for a reference to something. Um, make sure that you specify if I can mutate whatever this points to or not. So it, it also won't let you pass it a reference and be like, oh, take this thing and then change the value there. Unless you explicitly say, okay, it's a, it's a mutable reference to something else. Okay. And um, when you go back to the slide with the loops, um, uh, with uh, the vectors vector. and loops. The vector, yeah. Uh, oops, hey, to clean my glasses. Um, 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 there was a, uh, uh, when you double it, uh, uh in both cases, you write, probably. uh, uh, the, the, the content operator, uh, the multi plus sign uh, yes in this time you write uh, the uh, like in C the content operator and uh, in line 22 there you don't write it as I think the um, uh, the the um, the function in line in uh, line 9 seems to be uh the then there's it seems to be an uh, a function and uh so that you have to access it with the content operator and okay. in line 22 it's okay, you okay. Can directly access it yeah, yeah, access okay. it i understand i understand the question okay so the it's you know, both things, both ways achieve the same result, right? As, as this kind of confirms. They do it differently though, right? So um, this here, the back loop that starts at, at line nine um, it is a bit more of like a traditional iterative approach that you find in a lot of declarative, uh, sorry, procedural languages where you say like, for this many times do this, right? And uh we are basically here we're getting a we're getting access to the element sitting inside of this vector in a mutable mm -hmm. way and we we change it that's how this works right okay in, okay in this in this function here um as you map through the through the vector we're relying on the return value of this um of this lambda expression uh-huh. Basically okay. saying, okay, let it do something. It doesn't actually mutate underlying um, vector, right? Because C, it's actually we. It comes. It comes here with a just a regular a reference. Okay. And we, ah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we then return. So this collect. What what collect does is it says, okay, run run stuff on iterators and then collect it into the array into the vector, and that's what's returned. 
Okay. So it's it kind of it shows you a slightly different way of uh, of doing this in a more um, functional programming kind of way. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good questions. Uh, Paul uh, asked, "Is fn foo x pointer to string always the don't take ownership version uh, of um, foo x mute string?" Um, you so the ownership is the ownership is given away whenever you are referencing the type and not the reference to a given type. Um, again, the, the, uh, this whole, this, it kind of opens the whole can of worms as well because uh, basic types like integers and stuff, they, um, they support the copy trait. So copy trait is effectively a built-in mechanism to say, um, you can always make a copy of this. So whenever you pass um, an integer five or you know uh, even a float or something like that, so like a basic type, uh, I guess what we call scalar, um, it uh, it can get, it will get copied, and then the ownership is not an issue here. But uh, for for structured things like string, for example, whose um, whose um, size is not known at the compilation time. So it's something that's actually get allocated on the heap as opposed to uh, something that get can put on the stack. For those things, uh, for those things, you always transfer ownership if you do not use a reference. Yes. So I guess it's uh, the answer to your question is yes. But keep in mind um, the whole kind of copying that's accomplished automatically for um, for the basic types. I want to say basic types, those are your kind of usual um, numbers, uh, booleans, all that kind of stuff that you always know the size of the compile time. And those go on a step as opposed to the heap. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Can, you share, can you share about crates, Shivai? Uh, well, I'm going to share this real fast by saying crates is uh, basically the packaging system that uh, Rust has. So for people, for people in Python world, that's what you kind of do with like pip install your your usual packages. For for TypeScript, JavaScript people, that's npm basically. Um, Rust has its own X system. It's 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 uh, built in, so it's standard, uh, and it's and it's crates. So crate is a module that provides certain functionality and exposes it to um, to uh, the host program. So so those are crates. Nothing magical about them. So when it, whenever you hear crates, the thing package, easy. Um, and if you're confused about packages, uh, then you can look up. Uh, I mean, AP, npm or uh, Anything in the Python world as well through through pip install. So yeah. Um, all right, guys. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I will uh, I will leave link to the slides on the on the event page, and um, I will also point you to. I think the Rust links link is already there. I encourage you to uh, set it up on your computer and uh, go through it. And then um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can find me on you know, Twitter, GitHub, uh, philip at thebakery.io. Uh, I usually respond to emails. So I hope you liked it. It was a bit kind of all over the place, but I think I was overly ambitious with the, with the battle plan. And, uh, and we will see if we can set something up in the future. Uh, to kind of keep that uh, rust journey going. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Bye.